Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome out to the Grace Gospel Church. It's good to be here this morning. We do have a Bible in front of everybody, hymnal. Uh, today we're going to be looking in uh, Judges, the book of Judges. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books that Moses had wrote. Then Judges, or Joshua and Judges. So it'll be page 301 if you want to grab your Bible. But before we get there, before we get into Judges, we do have uh, you know, the prayer list. Uh, we review it every morning. We pray, and my wife and I, we pray for the people on the list. And if you want a copy of that, you can email me. We'll make sure you get a copy. And grace giving, you know, it's, uh, we'll pass the hat here. We're not, we're not looking to beg for money. We're a gospel-driven ministry here. If you want to support a gospel-driven mm -hmm. ministry, and if you want to invest in souls, there's an offering box in the back, and that's between you and the Lord. So, announcements. We've got some great announcements coming up. Uh, but on Facebook, you know, if you watch it online, you know, we have a pretty... Some people tuning in around uh, the world, actually. You know, we got people tuning in in Cameroon and the Philippines and uh, Kenya and uh, Pakistan. We actually did per church with Pakistan yesterday with Pastor Sharoon and his wife, Hira. Uh, we have a missions board. This is where, you know, if you do support the church here, you can see all the people, but Pastor Sharoon is right here. And, uh, you know, we support people around the world, but... That's what it's all about, is getting a clear message out there. I'm not a fan of religion, but I love Jesus Christ. I love the Bible. I love what he did for us. Um, we do have prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Great night to come out. It's a small group, five, six. Sometimes we get ten, but there's not a lot. But it's a great time to come out and share testimony, ask a question, you know, not uh, feel judged or anything. You know, we don't know everything, but a great place to be able to come. We have the first half hour's prayer. And then we get into the message. We have upcoming babies, which is pretty exciting. And Dr. Yank can be here, and then Bible camp is coming up. Um, any other announcements? All right. We do have uh, today, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about Gideon. But before we get into Gideon, we'll talk about the seven points of truth. And we'll first start with, uh, you know, we're sinners. Go to the jail every Monday night, and I tell the man, you know, I deserve to go to hell. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I know who I am. Somebody posted, you know, Facebook hypocrite. Well, yeah, you know, I, I'm a sinner. You know, nobody needs to point that out because I know who I am. I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. There's not nothing in me that's deserved to be saving. I don't. I can't earn it. Because of sin, I've deserved to go to hell. I know exactly who I am. And for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all born sinners. I'm conceived in sin. The word actually, the Greek word for sin comes from, you know, hamartanon. Hamartanon actually means to miss the mark. You missed the mark. You got to be perfect to go to heaven. But in conception, I was conceived in sin. I missed it from conception. Born with that flesh sin nature. But we've all missed that mark. And if that was the end, that would be the bad news. But we here are here to talk about the good news. We know that in Romans uh, 6.23, the Bible tells us way, wages of sin is death. Religion will tell you that you can you know, outweigh the bad with doing more good in your life. It's not true. Religion will tell you that you can go get water baptized, wash that sin off. You know, without soap, I can't even get dirt off my neck. No, wages of sin is death. Requires a sin, it requires a blood offering, a blood payment. For 1,500 years, they offered up animals, lambs, goats, bulls in the Old Testament. Not one of them paid for sin, but all pointed to Calvary. Requires a blood offering. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Going to heaven is a gift. That's the God that we serve. It's free. And you know what? Again, that's why man-made religions don't work. There's no church, there's no pastor, there's no priest. I never saved anybody in my life. There's not a pastor that saves anybody. We share God's word. God's word does the convicting. God's word does the saving. He is the one. But there's no church, no pastor, no priest, no ritual, no sacrament, no tradition or work of men that can pay for sin. Not one of them. My Bible says without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Heaven's a perfect place. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, how many sins did they commit before they were kicked out of the garden? One. 
and they were removed. God will not allow one sin into heaven. Look what it's done to this world. Look what it's done to us. I'm dying because of sin. It is sin that why we die. It's because we see cemeteries around the world proof that we're sinners. That's what sin does. It kills. So how many sins did Adam and Eve commit before they were banished? One. One sin will not be allowed into heaven. Heaven's perfect, and we're not perfect. We can't make ourselves perfect. Man cannot earn salvation. What a great verse here. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, unmerited favor, you do not deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not a works that any man should boast. I want you to think of these five words when we look at this verse. Christ died for my sins. I want you to remember those five words because it's by the grace that a person is saved through faith. Why? Christ died for my sins. It's not of yourself. Why? Christ died for my sins. It is a gift of God. Why? Christ died for my sins. Lest any man should boast. Why? Why am I not up here and saying, you know, how, why I'm going to heaven, all these great things? No. Lest any man should boast. Why? Christ died for my sins. If I'm going to boast in anything, I'm going to boast in Calvary. I'm going to boast what Christ did for me. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. It's by his grace and only revealed in Jesus Christ. It's why he died. It's why he revealed himself in the flesh. Christ died. That's history. Christ died for me. That's salvation. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Christ sinlessly perfect. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we receive his righteousness to get to heaven. Jesus Christ sinlessly perfect. Because Jesus Christ is sinlessly perfect, he can make a perfect sacrifice for sin. An infinite God can make an infinite payment for sin at a finite moment in time. Think about that. God can do that. If he can resurrect from the dead, if the grave can't conquer him, if death can't conquer him, he sure, surely can pay for all sin for all mankind. His resurrection is proof. Just look at Peter. When you know, Mary went to the tomb and it was open, the apostles didn't go. Peter didn't go. John didn't go. They said the tomb, the, the, the stone is rolled back. Matter of fact, Peter denied him three times before he went to Calvary. But after Peter found out he resurrected from the grave, changed Peter's life. Because we serve a living God. Not like these other false gods that they're still dead in a tomb, decayed, decomposed. We serve a living Savior that has resurrected from the grave. My God sits at the right hand of the Father. His resurrection is proof he paid for all sins for all mankind. Whole chapter dedicated to it is in 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says he was delivered for my offenses, my sins, and he was raised for our justification. Penalty for sin paid in full. Saved from a hell I deserve to heaven, I don't. Freely given to me. Colossians 2.13 tells us he paid for all trespasses. For every man that has ever lived, all sins are paid for. Does everybody go to heaven? No. You have to come to Christ by faith. It says, and you being dead in your sins, that's exactly who we are, dead in our sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, that he hath quickened, Christ hath quickened, made alive together with him, forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Everything I have done in my life, that I have done, done today, or will do tomorrow, it says, blotted out, paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a good God. The old man is cut off. That's what it talks about, you know, the uncircumcision of your flesh. The atomic nature, that's that old nature, the sin nature that's passed on that I gave my kid and my son and my daughter. That's the only thing that I've passed on to my kids is a sin-corrupted nature. That's what our dads do. We pass that sin on to our children. That's what you see. And this atomic nature is going to die one day. But ultimately, in God's eyes, it was cut off. And I'm seen as a new creation, a, one of God's children in Christ. The Adamic nature passed on through our dads. We're made alive when we believe. We come to Christ by faith. We have a new nature that's born from above. A nature that you can't see that lives within me. That's the seed of God planted in me and I get born again, born from above. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the King, as we sang this morning. It is only belief. 
It is only belief. For God so loved the world, for God, put your name in there, for God so loved Carla, for God so loved Garrett, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love so deep that it reaches from heaven to earth. God's love is so broad that it encompasses every human being that's ever lived. Anyone can get saved because it says whosoever wants to believe in Christ alone, they can be saved. Just like the thief on the cross, these two gentlemen right here deserved to die. And one of them changed their mind. He didn't get down and get water baptized, dedicate his life, give money, become, you know, dedicate foodless shelters, homeless shelters, and soup banks and things like that. No, he changed his mind. He trusted in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Jesus said, today thou will be with me in paradise. For God so loved the world, put your name in there, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, go to hell, but have everlasting life. Anyone who says a person can lose their salvation, think about this. Anybody that says you can lose your salvation does not believe it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Anyone says you can lose your salvation does not believe Christ did enough. They're trusting in their works. Anyone who says a person can lose their salvation is a false prophet preaching a false message. Because my God paid for all sin for all humanity. My God says he offers me eternal life. It's a free gift. Do you believe it or not? Salvation is either by grace or works. It cannot be both. But my Bible says it is by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Truthfully, truthfully, here, it's a present tense. Eternal life is a present tense possession. It's just like Emma, the little baby over here. When do you teach Emma to walk? Before she's born or after she's born? After she's born. First she has to be born. Service comes after salvation. And it's when her parents conceived her, she was a baby. It's the same thing for us. You receive that eternal life the second you come to Christ by faith. Verily, verily, I say unto he that believeth on me, have everlasting life. Something I received when my sister died in 1978. I went to a Bible camp in 79, and I have had eternal life since 1979 when I placed my faith in Christ alone. Everlasting life is something that a person receives the second they believe. What peace is that? Bless you. To know nothing that I'm doing, or I got to keep doing to keep being saved. No. My salvation is rested in the finished work of Christ. That's what he promises in Titus 1 2. In hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began, before creation was ever created, the everlasting gospel was already written down the plan of salvation. It's something that's always been promised. God knew man was going to sin and need a Savior. It's also something that you can know before you die. These things are written on you. Believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. The child of God can know they have eternal life because that's what God promises. I can't trust in myself, but I can sure trust in the written word of God, for sure. The child of God can know they have eternal life because it's not based on what we have done or are doing or will be doing. It's based upon what Christ had already done for us. That's good news. Seven points of truth. We're going to look at Gideon, page 301 in the Bible, in the church's Bible, you have one. You can follow along. We might flip over to, to certain books, if you, but I encourage you to read it out of the word of God. <coughs> Gideon is an interesting individual. He is the sixth judge. He's the sixth judge of Israel before we had kings. In Judges 6, 11 through 12, it says, There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abi Abizarite, and his son Gideon. So we read about his dad there, Joash. Threshing wheat by the one wine press. You know, they would thresh the wheat, the grain, and they would remove the chaff to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, And the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. When we read Judges chapter 6, you might be like, Well, he wasn't quite a mighty man of valor. But when you read Judges 8 there, you will see that, you know, how the Lord had patience with Gideon. And how the Lord used Gideon. It's an incredible story. Valor means strength, might, force, display of power. 
But you will hear about Gideon, a man who was fearful, scared. But because of God, as God, Jehovah God, and Gideon could, have, could move with power and strength when he was yet fearful. Gideon is definitely, you know, courageous. And that's what courage is. Being able to move forward when, when somebody has, when you're fearful, you know, but you know that God's got it. I think we can all learn something from Gideon, having the ability to move forward and do God's work when feeling scared, fearful, anxious, nervous, depressed. But we know Gideon's story starts in chapter 6 of Judges. He dies in Judges 8, 32. The rest of the chapters 8 and 9 discuss his descendants. He had 70 boys. You know, and the impact he had on Israel. He said he had multiple wives. But Gideon is the sixth judge of Israel. Now, Israel was brought out of Egypt. They were in persecution for 400 years under Egypt. They were slaves. We know that Jacob brought them down. Joseph was the, you know, the second in command of Egypt when they had uh, you know, a famine. Jacob brought his family down there, but then there became a new pharaoh that did not remember Joseph and then took the Israelites, and they were ultimately made slaves for 400 years under Egypt. And the Lord delivered them out of Egypt. That's where we got the Passover lamb, like last week, how Christ is our Passover lamb, how the blood had to be appointed to the doorposts of the house and things like that. But they were brought into a land that Palestine, Canaan, that was the God promised them, this is your land. And he says, there's going to be seven mightier nations than you there. But he says, I, you know, I will deliver them out. I just need you to trust me and you go in the land and take it. Well, they came in and they did not do what God said. Same thing here in the United States. I feel like these are the days where there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own, own eyes. We see some of the things teaching our kids what is completely wrong and evil, and they're saying it's right, which is sad. But here we are, the Israel at a time where Israel, with God, they seen and remembered what God did for them, yet they did what they thought was right in their own eyes. Caused them some problems as a nation. Israel was told that to do when they were come up into Canaan, they were to destroy the nations set before them. The Lord delivered these seven greater, mightier nations before them. And they were said, take them. Israel did not drive out the greater and mightier nations before them. Instead, they dwelt among them. And here's the problem. Their sons and their daughters married these Canaanite boys and girls, and they ended up worshiping false gods. Because of Israel's disobedience, those nations would be thorn in Israel's side. God told them that. You don't want to listen to me? All right, then I'm going to have... I will, just like a dad does, he chastens his children, and the Lord will chasten Israel. Judges chapter 2, 1 through 3, and it says, An angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land where I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. No, he won't. The Abrahamic covenant that he promised that we're saved by grace through faith will forever last. It's an unconditional, unilateral covenant that God will never break. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land, no treaty, no contract. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. And yet, why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides. Their God shall be a snare unto you. And that's what religion does. A snare, false gods, idolatry becomes a snare unto us. They worshipped Baal and Ashtaroth. They were fertility gods, Phoenician gods. Though They forsook the Lord. And the Lord there is capital in the King James. You'll see that's capital L-O-R-D. Now, if it's just a capital L, little O, little R, little D, it's a means in the Hebrew, Adonai, which is master. But if you have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital M, means Jehovah God. Yahweh, we're speaking of Jesus Christ. And they forsook the Lord. And serve Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal, a male Phoenician god of fertility, and Ashtoreth. I think we still see Baal and Ashtoreth today because we see different 
you know, cultures rename these, you know. Baalzebub, you know, was the Lord of the Flies. Asterisk, I think every time I drive by a coffee shop, I think I see, see Asterisk on the coffee cup. Anyways, the Lord would deliver Israel into the hands of these nations whom the Israel were to destroy. These nations would persecute Israel. Israel would then cry unto the Lord for deliverance because of persecution, and the Lord would raise up a judge. And that's the times we're talking about here. You've heard of a man named Samson. That's Samson we'll be talking about. He is, was a judge. But judges here in two, chapter 2, verse 16... Here's what they would do. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. Stiff-necked, hard-headed people. Sometimes reminds me of myself. But they went whoring after other gods. That's what idolatry is. See, our God's a jealous God. And bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked, in obeying the commandments of the Lord. But they did not so. And when the Lord raised up judges, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. That's what human nature does. In following other gods to serve them, to bow down unto them, they cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So Gideon is a sixth judge. Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord delivered Israel in the hand of Midian. So let's talk about Gideon. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So again, I encourage you to get your Bible out, because we're going to read off and on Judges chapter 6. And let's read Judges chapter 6, verse 2 through 5. I don't have the verses up there, but I just will read and we'll talk a little bit about it. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds, living in caves. And so it was when Israel had sown, the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they come up against them. And they encamped against them. They surrounded them and destroyed the increase of earth till thou come into Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Sounds like they lived in the caves, the Israelites. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and men from the east came and took their crops, livestock. They took it. It was ultimately the threshing time. There was time of the year where they're you know, getting ready for the grain to make you know, the wheat and things. And they came up and took all what they had. The Midianites and Amalekites and men from the east destroyed everything in that land there where they were staying. We know that Israel cried unto the Lord there in verse 6. I already had it up there. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. God sends them a prophet. Look at verse 8 through 10. The Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thou sayest the Lord God of Israel, Lord God, Jehovah God, I brought you up from Egypt, brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drove them out from before you, gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Israel needed to be reminded of what God has done for them. He delivered them out of the hands of Egypt, who oppressed them for 400 years. He gave them their own land, and I too think, remind this of myself, I think we need to be reminded of what God has done for us in our lives. We soon forget, I forget about God's grace, forget about his provision, Forget about his goodness. The Bible tells us over in 2 Peter chapter 1 that we are to be in constant remembrance, the seven points of truth that we review. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the presence too. So we're to be established, so ingrained that we would not waver. We're not like a reed in the water, but we're an oak by the river. 
Yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up, putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle. Obviously, Peter going to die, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decrease, decease, to have these things always in remembrance. We need to be constantly reminded that it does that we're saved by grace through faith and that we grow in grace in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, something happens. It's called fall from grace. We don't lose our salvation. I can never lose my salvation because once a child, forever a child. But I can go back under an Old Testament. I can go back under a law. I can go back under religion. I can go back under a works for salvation. That's what Galatians is all about. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Individuals that got saved. And then they would go back under a religious performance system. And look what it says there in Galatians 5.4. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by law, you are fallen from grace. In the Galatians, they were saved. In Galatians 1, they talk about, you know, how Christ died, delivered them from this earth. And then somebody came in and perverted the gospel. They added works to it. They told them that they needed to be circumcised. They had to go back under the law, which is a false message. And it's the same thing today. It's grace versus works. And 99.9 of the churches preach works. And what was the point of this then? Once saved, always saved is true. A person can never be cast out, lost, or plucked out. My Bible says when I get saved, it's Christ that holds on to me, and no man's able to pluck them out of my hand. I am a man, and I can't even pluck them myself. He will never cast me out. He will never lose me. That's grace. However, a child of God who was once clear in the gospel of Christ, living by grace, growing in the knowledge of Christ, can fall from grace. I've seen it. They go back on a religious performance system where Christ has no effect on your life because you're living a life in the flesh. Yes, we need to be reminded God hears the cries of Israel back to Gideon. God starts by sending a prophet, and he reminds them. Remember, in Judges 6, 8, this is what God has done for you. Then we see what happens next. We see a man named Gideon. He's threshing wheat in hiding. If you look at Judges chapter 6, verse 11, Gideon threshing wheat by the winepress and hid it from the Midianites. Gideon meets an angel of the Lord, but later we know that this angel of the Lord is Jehovah God himself, because we see it in Judges 6, 14 through 16, actually says, and the Lord, Jehovah God, looked upon him and said, go in this thy might. Thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, Adonai, Master, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family's poor in Manasseh. I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord, Jehovah God, said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. So we know the angel of the Lord was the Lord speaking, the pre-incarnate Christ. So the Lord is sending Gideon to deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Let's look at Judges chapter 6, verse 11 through 14, and read here. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an oak for all that pertaineth unto Joash the Abizurite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress and hid it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon's probably looking around over, like, you talking to me? And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? Why has all this happened to us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, and now the Lord hath forsaken us, delivered us into the hands of the Midianites? And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? I think in verse 13, Gideon's blaming God. Do we not blame God sometimes in our life? I think we do. Gideon saying to the Lord, if you be with us, then why is this persecution happening upon us? Why is Midianites have come and they've taken all our food and all of our cattle? 
destroyed our land. Well, you know why? Because Israel was told to destroy these nations and not worship other gods. It's not God's fault. But so, you know, the only person I can blame in my life is me. I can only see the goodness of God working in my life. When I look back, I can only see God. It's me that has rebelled. It's me that has brought the problems in my life. If that did not happen, and because of this, there will be consequences when they did not drive out these people. God tells Gideon to go in his might, the strength of the Lord, and through his strength of the Lord, Gideon will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Gideon doesn't believe it. Doesn't believe it. Verse 15. And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my father is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Gideon says his family is poor. They're weak. They're low. They have no status. He's of the tribe of Manasseh. Gideon says he's the least, the little, the youngest of his family. He's insignificant in his father's house. Not only am I our family, but I, in my family, I'm the lowest. Gideon seems himself unfit for duty. How many of us feel sometimes unfit, unqualified to do God's work? Yeah, we do sometimes. I know I do. I pray for God's grace each and every day to be able to do his work. I'm unworthy to go to the jail to share the gospel. I'm unworthy, you know. Nobody deserves to be a pastor or anything like that. It is by God's grace that we can sit here and read his word and share God's word to anybody. I already told you what I deserve. Gideon wants a sign, 16 through 21. He wants a sign. And you're going to see this over and over with Gideon. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites one man. And he said unto him, If, the, if, I, if now I found, have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come out thee. So he says, Wait here, wait here, and bring thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid. He took a, a baby goat and unleavened cakes. Unleavened means without yeast. Of ephah, flour, and the flesh. So he's making him some food. Put in a basket, and he put in the broth in the pot, brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of the God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon the rock. Pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Sometimes I remember, you know, as a kid, I'd be like, I would ask for a sign. You know, maybe, maybe the people to be like, show us a sign. Well, we've, we've been given the greatest sign ever. There's some religious people that came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12. Israel wants always a sign. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says in verse 39 and 4, he says, but he answered, and he said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, what did the book of Jonah? Jonah was ultimately, he rebelled against God. He was told to go up and share the gospel with these people up in here. And he went the other way. Went on a boat and he actually went the other way. He disobeyed God. And we know there was a great fish prepared and ultimately ate Jonah. And three days and three nights he was in the bale, the whale, the in the belly of this great fish, and then this fish cast him out in three days. And that's what ultimately pointing to Calvary, because we know the whole Testament points pictures of Jesus. So verse 40 there, and for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, when Christ died, he didn't go to heaven. We know that Hades has two chambers, one side called torment, and the other side called paradise. Everybody in the Old Testament either went to torment side or paradise side. When Christ died, he went down to paradise and he led captivity captive and he brought all the people in paradise up to heaven. Why is that important? I think to me, it's, 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 it's hugely important because it shows you the significance of the blood of Christ. Christ had not paid for sin yet. So, God created a space in the belly of the earth called paradise. And that's where they went, and that's where the thief went. Today thou shalt be with paradise. 
And the, and ultimately Psalm 16, Acts chapter 2, speaks of it, how he descended first and then he ascended. He, he led captivity captive. And then we also know that there's a chamber on this side called torment, where the rich man is today, and anybody that ultimately does not believe goes there. And one day, in Revelation chapter 20, they will go to what's called the great white throne judgment, where they'll be cast in the lake of fire for all eternity. Their choice, if they want to go to heaven or not, Christ paid. But if a person is seeking truth, we've been given the greatest sign, the resurrection of Christ. Today we have God's word. It's complete, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This word is complete. We don't need signs today. We have God's word, and because of God's word, we are equipped to be able to do his work. We have his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, it tells us all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. God's breathed word. Yes, the Bible is written over 1,500 years, 40 different authors, 66 different books, 1,500 years, and not one contradiction. Now, man has mistranslated it from the Hebrew to English or from the Greek to the English. But there is, God doesn't have any mistakes in his word. It's his God's breathed word. It's profit for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. That's all we need in life, right? There's God's word. That the man of God may be perfect, he might be fitted, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So after I'm saved, God wants to use me to bring other people to Christ. For Gideon, he did not have the complete word of God. He did not. However, he verbally heard the word of God, the obvious sign is that God will be with him. That's what he tells him in verse 16. I will be with thee. God will not let Gideon be alone through this ordeal with Midian. The miracle or sign is nice, but having God's word is absolute assurance and important. When God says, I will be with thee, there's an absolute assurance and confidence received when a person hears this from God. To know that God's with me all the time is just a blessing. So what does Gideon do? He builds an altar. Judges chapter 6, verses 22 through 24, he builds an altar there. And the same night, we know that he destroyed in 25 through 28. Let's read 25 through 28. He destroys the altars of Baal and the groves of Ashtaroth. And it came to pass the same night the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old. Throw down the altar of Baal. That thy father hath, and cut down the grove that's by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and over and offer a burnt sacrifice with wood and grove which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men and his servants and did as the Lord had said unto them, and it was because he feared his father's house hold, and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And when the men of the city rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. The second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. I think there's an important lesson in there. Is he feared his dad. He had respect for his dad. But he feared the Lord more. We should respect our parents. We should respect our country and people in power. But more importantly, we should respect our Father in heaven, the Lord, because he is the final authority. We know that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in 34, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. See, in the Old Testament, individuals are never indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Never indwelt. Today, every child of God is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I didn't put it in there, my bad. But if you look at, uh, I'll just read 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The second I came to Christ by faith, I have this old nature. And when I believe, God put his seed in me. And ultimately I got a new nature. I have an old flesh nature that's going to die. But I have a new nature that will separate from my body one day, absent from the body and present with the Lord. And ultimately through the Holy Spirit, you know, that's how I can have victory in my Christian life. This new man that's created in Christ doesn't do it on his own. 
Ultimately, the Holy Spirit works through each and every one of us. That's why as a child of God, can I live like the devil and look like the world? Yeah. Can I get away with it? No. Chastening. Does God want us to look like the devil, to live like a devil? No, he doesn't. When I had my children, my son and my daughter, I didn't want my son and daughter. I didn't be like, held my son the first time and be like, matter of fact, I was so angry at a time in my life, I didn't cry. I thought I'd cry was weakness. And when my son was born, I actually weeped like a baby. And instantly I thought, do you want your son to grow up to be who you are today? And I'm like, no, I don't. Had me, I was talking to myself. Now, I still struggle with many things. But that's not what God wants for us. I don't lose my salvation, but I will be chastened. I will, I will get disciplined, spanked sometimes. But we have the Holy Spirit within us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which you have of God, you are not of your own, for you are bought with a price. I am bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And it took me a while to understand that. Through my 20s and 30s, I didn't live like a child of God. I was still saved. But ultimately, come to the understanding, if I was the only one that's ever lived, would Christ still have died for me? Yeah, he would have. That says a little bit about who I am, a little bit of value. Sometimes we don't value ourselves, but I tell you what, if you were the only one that was ever to live, Christ would have still died for you. That says you're valuable. Heard Yankee speaking this week. He says, you know what? In heaven, we're going to be singing and praising and doing all of these things. He says, you know what in heaven we'll not be able to do? Share the gospel. We won't be able to do that in heaven. Why? Because we'll all be saved. There will be, there will be no lost in heaven. He says, so even though it's great to go to church and sing and praise and do all these things, have fun, he says, but you know, we're left behind here for a reason, and that is to share the gospel. How Christ died upon the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again, and simply trusting in that. That's what it's all about. Let's go back to Gideon, chapter 6, verse 35. Gideon gathers men for battle. He brings 32,000 men. You're going to see this. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered under him, and sent messengers unto Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they came up to meet when those are the other tribes of Israel. Remember, there's 12 tribes. And Gideon tests God's goodness and faithfulness again. He has this prayer fleece. He takes this, this fleece of wool. He says, Lord, if, it, if, you're, if your hand's going to be in my life, if you're going to guide me through this, and he says, you're truly going to give me the victory, I'm going to lay out this fleece, this piece of wool, and he says, in the morning, everything around it will be dry, but my fleece, the dew will make the fleece wet, this piece of wool wet. He gets up in the morning, and he wrings out a bowl, fills a bowl, everything else is dry. The dew was just only on this piece of wool. And he says, you know, he says, God, he says, if, if your hand's really going to be in my life and I, and I can truly trust that you're going to deliver me, he says, you know, don't be angry with me. He says, but, you know, he says, I'm going to test you again. He says, I'm going to lay that piece of fleece out again, that wool. And he says, I'm going to, I want that to be dry. And everything around it, the dew, ultimately gets wet. And it happens. And that's what he says there. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, and thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed out the dew of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me. I will speak but this once, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on the ground. Through this whole trial, God has patience with Gideon. I think I can only see God's hand of patience in my life sometimes. We drop down to Judges 7, 1 through 3. 32,000 men gathered. Then Jerubbabel, which we know is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the hosts of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. 
And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Let Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. The Lord, Gideon brings in 32,000 people, men from these other tribes. The Lord says, too many. Because when ultimately when I give the victory, Israel will say they won it, not the Lord. He says, tell them, anybody man scared, send them away. 22,000 men. 10,000 left. Judges 8, 12. In 8, 10 there, it tells us there's 120,000 that were killed and another 15,000. That means there's 135,000 Midianites. And there's 10,000 of them. Look what the Lord says here. He says, too many. Look at 4 through 6. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee. And of whomever I say unto thee, this shall go, not go with thee, the same shall not go. And he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lappeth, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. So the individuals that got down and lapped it like a dog, 9,700, they can go. The men that sat there and kept their eyes on the horizon, that kneeled down and dipped the water and drank like this. There was 300 of them. 300. I remember watching the movie 300. I'm like, man, you know, the Battle of Thermopolis. Well, here we are, the true 300 against 135,000 Midianites and Malachites. If you look down there in John, Judges 7, 12, it says they numbered the valley like grasshoppers and the Midianites and the Malachites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers. Multitudes and their camels were without numbers as the sand by the sea side for multitude. Hmm. God says, I'm going to take 300 men, Gideon, and you're going to defeat all of these people. He probably was really scared. I can't even imagine. But this was by God's design. Let's read 7 through 9. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. Let all the other people go every man into his place. So the people took victuals, food in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent. And retained these 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. So you can see they're up on the mountain. The Midianites are in the valley. And it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. God knew that Gideon was scared. In verse 11 there, he says, And thou shalt wear, hear what they say, and afterwards shall... Oh, verse 10, But if thou fear to go down, thou with Fura, thy servant, down to the host, thou shalt hear what they say. So God tells Gideon, Go down to the camp. You're going to hear the Midianites say something about you. So he goes down, and afterwards shall the hands of be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, which shows that he was scared, under the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Drop down to 13. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto the tent, and smote it, and it fell, and it overturned it that the tent lay long. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else except the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. 15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered unto, into your hands the host of Midian. 
He goes down in the valley, 135,000 Midianites, Malachites, and he hears these men speaking in the night. Did you have a dream? Yeah, I had a dream. I had a dream too. The hand of the Lord was going to deliver me, Gideon. He didn't know these men, but they knew his name. He knew that they were going to have victory. And right then and there, he says, 16 through 25, he takes victory. Gideon and the three men, 300 men had victory over the Midianites. Basically what he does is they take these vases and they put light in the vases and they all had a trumpet. 300 men split up, 100 over here, 100 over here, and 100 over here. And Gideon says, on this sign, we're going to go down and yell and break this vase and ultimately blow this trumpet. And it caused chaos in all the Midianites. I mean, remember, they don't have street lights, They don't have flashlights. It's complete darkness. And they all turn on each other. And the Lord delivers victory unto Gideon. This one victory in Gideon's life gave him confidence to lead. When you read Judges 8, completely different individual, how he deals with the people. Live a life filled with confidence in the Lord. With the Lord, Gideon established himself as a man of faith, a man of valor, a mighty man, a man of courage, and a warrior for the Lord. There were times when Gideon's faith was lacking, but the Lord was patient, and the Lord is patient with us. The Lord established Gideon's faith. If you lack faith, if you lack something, ask. Go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help me with this. Help me with this struggle, this thought. Help me be a better husband. Help me be a better wife. Help me you know, be a better child, a better employee, whatever it is. The Lord strengthened Gideon's faith. The Lord is patient with us also. And ask the Lord to provide whatever you're lacking to help you in your ministry. Something happened. The men, Israel came to him and they said, we want you to be our king. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's sons, for thou hast delivered us from the hand. In his wisdom, Gideon says, No, absolutely not. He says, and he, he remained humble. He demonstrated his humility, and he remained faithful in the Lord. He says, No, I will not be your king. He says, The Lord rules over you. And Gideon said unto him, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And I say, why do men always want other men to rule over them? I don't answer to any man. I answer to God. And what wisdom Gideon had for his people. Like my son and my daughter, we tell, I don't, hopefully they don't get their wisdom from me. I want them to go directly to the source of wisdom. They have a direct source to God. And the Lord shall rule over you. Read the word of the Lord. Allow your Father in heaven to rule over you. Be obedient to your Father in heaven. Be subject to him. Yield yourself to your Father in heaven. Allow his word to dwell in you. Gideon and demonstrated living by faith. In Proverbs chapter 3, it tells us this. Now this would be contradictory to the man's philosophy, but I don't care what man's philosophy. We stand on biblical truths, not political correctness. In Proverbs 3, 5-7, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Even when you think, you know, everything is going bad in your life and the, the Lord's reaching over the light switch, God works everything for good. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. Because sometimes we want to lean back and be like, hmm, that doesn't look right. No, we should lean into the Lord. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord. That means respect. Depart from evil. The Lord will never lead a person to do wrong. The Lord will never lead me to do the wrong. He's holy. To lead me by the Lord, a child must have his word in them, guide them. Lean not into thine own understanding, but lean into the Lord. In every path, every walk, acknowledge him, represent him, walk him as walk as if Jesus and the Father are right with you. How we treat people, things like that. Live a life of respecting your Father in heaven. We need to remember as sinners, saved by grace, God only uses ordinary, broken individuals to accomplish his success. To pour us out and to fill, be filled up so he gets the glory. There are no perfect individuals. And I say, do you know why God needs, why, what God needs? He needs faithful children to live by faith. That's what he wants us to do, to just live by faith, to serve him, honor him, respect him every day in our lives as children. To live by the side of faith and not by the fleshly side of the eyes. Again, when Gideon was a man in hiding and he later fought God's Lord's battle with 300 men. A 451 to ratio. 
by the world's standards, the world would say, never would that happen. But we know that with God, anything is possible. Gideon wanted the Lord will to be done in his life. In Romans 12, 12, 1, it says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is speaking to believers that our, that our life would say something to the lost. Holy, acceptable in the God, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable service because he purchased us from how we deserve to heaven. We don't. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? Reading the word of God actually transforms our mind. That you may prove what's good, acceptable, perfect, the will of God. That we may prove to the world, the lost, what's good, acceptable, the will of God. There's nothing extraordinary about these men and women in the Old Testament. What's extraordinary is that God used these men and women. The God of patience, the God of grace, the God of mercy uses men and women with flaws to accomplish his plan. That's an awesome God. In Colossians chapter 3, 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. That's why we read. That we can meditate on the word of God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What's the word of God do? It teaches us and instructs us. That's what the word of God does. Another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amazing grace. And whatsoever you do, a word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Man. Thankful for everything that he's done in my life. He's only been good to me. Even when my sister died, he's only been good to me because it's through my sister's death that my family got saved. The first application here, I think with Gideon, is there a truth to proclaim? Yeah, through the trials of life, let your faith continue to increase because that's what trials are. Trials are like the dross that you put silver in and the fire draws out the dross. It purifies your faith that you can see, that you can look back in your life and be like, look who was faithful in my life. It was God. He delivered me through these trials. Is there a promise to proclaim? I think there is. Nothing's impossible without God. Is there a sin to avoid? I would say there is. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're nervous, learn to go to the Lord and allow him to help you with your th these things. As did Gideon. Gideon was scared to death. How many times did he ask God to show him a sign? He was clearly anxious but learn to go, Lord, and allow him to work and do his will in your life because he will help you. Now the gospel is this. I'm not making this stuff up. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received and wherein you stand, by which you're saved. So we know it's the gospel that saves. If you keep in memory what I preached unto, unto you, unless you have believed in vain, and that's the resurrection related to the resurrected Savior, he is, he is risen, so our faith is not in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. He calls us by the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, verse 14, it says, Wherefore, he called you by our gospel. In Acts 16, the invitation is this. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let this hand here represent you and I. I want to show you something. This hand here, this is how I got saved. Let this hand here represent you and I, and this wallet here represents our sin. See, God loves us, God, so, for God so loved Lance, but he hates my sin. Now, if I want to reject what Christ did for me, I'll go to hell, I need to go to hell and pay for my sin for all eternity because I can never make a perfect sacrifice. We know sin separates us from God. Man will try to tell you that you can cover that sin up by doing good deeds, doing good works, but without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Somebody has to die for it. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He's God from eternity past, revealed himself in the flesh, and he went to the cross. He loved you so much. When he was on the cross, he had you on his mind. And he shed his blood for you. He loved you. He paid for every one of your sins, even the ones you've not committed yet. He was buried for you, and he resurrected the third day, showing you the payment for sin paid in full. And when you believe that, 
He did that for you. He gives you his righteousness put to your account. Getting a new nature, sinless nature, that's forever going to be with God. I would ask that everybody just close their eyes for a second here. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, what's stopping you from doing it right now? I just want to give everybody a second in the quietness of their mind to talk to God. If you're saved, you know you're going to heaven. Maybe you trusted in Christ alone a while back. But if you're not saved, if you've never done this, what's stopping you doing it right now? You could say something like this to God. It's not what you say, it's what you believe, but I would hope that you would believe this. You could say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. And right now, I will believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, was buried and resurrected for me. I'm trusting in Christ alone to save me. Not asking you to make any promises, not asking you to give any money, not asking you to change anything, simply asking you to believe what Christ had already done for you. It's a personal decision between you and God. But if you did that, why don't you say, Father, thank you, because you were just born again. It is that easy. And you can know you have eternal life. Why? Because Christ died for all of your sins. There's no more sin to be paid for. That's the good news. If you'd open your eyes, we're going to have communion. We'll go about five minutes over, but I think that's all right. If we could have Darren and Braden and Garrett and Nate grab the bread and the juice. They'll pass it out. Christine will play a little music for us. We'll partake it together. Kevin will pray for us. So you can grab the bread and juice and we'll disperse it to together and then we'll take it together. <clears throat> If you're at home, grab some juice and bread and take communion with us.
तो सही दी जाए One thing, communion doesn't save us. It is water baptism or anything like that. The bread and juice does not transform in the body. It doesn't turn into the flesh of Christ. It doesn't turn into the blood of Christ. Communion is a remembrance. You'll see that. It's where we give thanks. Once a month, we're to be told to, to partake in communion, weekly even, but we do this in remembrance of what Christ did for us. That's why we do communion. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25, it says, For I received the Lord, that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, Kevin? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, which you stand on the foundation of Christ, that he is the Messiah. He's the one that shed his blood on our behalf. We thank you for getting death out of our way. And we can live a life without fear. We thank you so much for what you've done for us, Lord. And help us to remember your faith and your body. When giving thanks, he break it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. We'll close in the word. Dear Heavenly Father, again, Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're so grateful for your love and grace and mercy. We're so grateful that your son voluntarily laid his life down for each and every one of us and paid the penalty for sin. And all we have to do is believe you did that for us. We receive eternal life. We're born into your family. And Father, we just pray that you'd be with my mom. She's been sick for a while. Pray that you deliver your hand will be in her life and you deliver her from this. Pray that you be with Marge, whose birthday's coming up. We pray that she could be in her new place here soon. We pray for patience. We know you've brought her this far and we know you will deliver her all the way home. And Father, we just pray that you'd be with, be with the people here today. You know their thoughts. You know their, what they're thinking, their prayers. We just pray, Father, that your will would be done in each of these people's lives. Bring us back next week where we can continue to give glory to you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We'll have our last song, Kevin and Christine. Nothing but the blood.